2 Sloan Park, Mesa, Arizona. Our first game of the spring has the Sox getting together with the Cubs out west. Jason Benetti, Steve Stone along with you. And Jason, welcome to the White Sox broadcast. We're going to be doing 10 of these from spring training, then kick off the year. And this year, the Sox seem to have a much more positive attitude than in years past, and hopefully they carry it through to the season. A lot of changes in that clubhouse, and the big news is 20 home runs already through the first 10 games this spring. Last year was a big problem. The Sox couldn't hit the ball out of the ballpark. They couldn't score any runs. Adam Eaton is hitting the ball unbelievably well, as is Jose Abreu. And Avisail Garcia, probably the biggest surprise of the spring. If he continues to hit the ball well, I think the offense is going to be much improved over last year. Many different faces in that clubhouse. How does that change what's going on with the Sox? There's a lot better chemistry this year than last. For whatever reason, they have a whole lot of confidence, and we certainly hope that that confidence translates into performance. If it does, it's a wide-open division, and the Sox are as good as anybody. Sox and Cubs just around the corner from beautiful Arizona. Sox and Cub fans getting together as we have first pitch coming up next. Miller Lite, the original light beer. It's Miller time. Honda, get amazing deals at the Honda Dream Garage sales event. Now at your Honda dealer. Xfinity, your home for the most live sports. Ford, America's best-selling brand, six years running. Inviting you to check out our fuel-efficient lineup at your local Ford store or at localfordstores.com. And by your Chicago and Northwest Indiana Hyundai dealers. Stop by a local Hyundai dealer today to test drive their all-star lineup of cars and SUVs. Visit buyhyundai.com. Chicago White Sox baseball in high definitions brought to you by Xfinity, your home for the most live sports. Stoney, this doubles is chilly in Arizona. It doesn't hit 80. You gotta wear long sleeves evidently I'm learning very quickly I think a lot of people are surprised that the temperatures have dipped into the 70s which isn't exactly a cold spell but it does qualify here because we've had just gorgeous weather this spring it's been mostly in the middle 80s and I think that's one of the reasons why if you talk to players most of the players except perhaps for pitchers who like Florida a little bit more because of the humidity players love Arizona because of the consistent weather and the fact that the infield is rock hard. If you're a hitter, you love to hit in Arizona, and you look at some of the gaudy numbers this spring, and you'll see why. 
Sox have hit the ball very well so far. Ten games in, they're at 301 as a team. 20 home runs after just 22 last spring, all spring. Tell you about the Sox lineup scribbled out by Robin Ventura. Adam Eaton once again DHs. He's yet to play the field here this spring. Lori and Abreu in the three spot. Frazier, Cabrera, Garcia, Avila, Saladino, and Leori Garcia, who's got a home run. Coming up from yesterday's game, a four-home run day for the White Sox in that one against the Padres. What's defense look like, Stone? Let's take a look at the defense and how Joe Madden's going to line them up. And bear in mind, it's a split squad game, so there's some names you don't know. John Andrioli in left field. It's Dexter Fowler, a familiar name in center. Jason Hayward, their new addition in right field, and he's a good one. Jamer Candelario at third base with Christopher Negron at short. Then it's... Muniori Kawasaki, you might remember him for Toronto. He plays second base today. Anthony Rizzo, their star first baseman, with Tim Fedorovich behind the plate, and Jason Hamill on the hill. Hamill had a very good first half last year, had some physical problems the second half. Wasn't quite the same pitcher, but he's a slider waiting to happen. That's his best pitch. That's the pitch that is his comfort pitch, and that's what he'll use with a less than overpowering fastball. Well, Jason Hamill's just been an innings eater. 20 or more starts the last seven seasons in the majors. And this year, he's probably going to be their number four starter. And with that in mind, they certainly want to have him replicate the first half of the year, not necessarily the second half, because they have some innings eaters as the, the top three in their lineup with the addition of John Lackey, which was a great free agent acquisition. Well, before we get underway, thank you so much for the warm welcome and thanks to everybody in Chicago for bringing me in with such open arms. It's really nice to see a local product, and you are from Homewood Flossmore, get a chance to do something that he wanted to do his whole life, which was not only Major League Baseball, but Major League Baseball for the team he rooted for growing up. And we hope that it's a very long, very successful, and very entertaining career for you here with the White Sox. I believe they said it in Casablanca. This is the start of a beautiful friendship. And I do believe that a good team will make us sound a whole lot better. Adam Eaton, first batter today of our first game of the spring, and he takes ball one. Plate umpire today is Rob Drake. Well, mention it during the lineups, Adam Eaton has yet to play the outfield so far because of that shoulder injury, and the Sox just taking their time with him. He's proven over the last couple of years that he can hit, so they're not worried about that at all. To short, Christopher Negron, the first put out today in Mesa. I think what the Sox would love to see from Adam Eaton, and he hasn't been able to do it successfully yet, is improve his base stealing skills. He's a pretty good base runner, but base stealing has been somewhat of a problem for him. And last year, after a fairly slow start, he had a huge second half. One down for one of those additions we talked about in the open, Brett Lorry, who spent time with the A's. He spent time with the Blue Jays as well. He's one of a couple guys added to this team that are not going to get cheated in the words per minute department. He certainly is intense, and he's going to bring that intensity to the park with him every day. Plus, he can hit the ball out of the ballpark, and that's going to be something that Sox haven't had for a second baseman in a while. And as you can see, there is no sparing of the eye black here in the early going of spring training. It's like an extra in the next Marvel movie, doesn't he? <laughs> My goodness. I think what he's trying to figure out so far that nobody has figured out is on a double play who he's going to be getting the ball from at second. Two right center, and Lori has the first hit, his fourth of the spring. Saladino in the lineup today playing shortstop, but Jimmy Rollins has played well this spring. And when you look at that, how important is that double play combination? I think it's vitally important. And take a look at this turn at first base. This is what Robin is talking about with all of his players. Take an aggressive turn. Think about two bases before you're stopped. Make sure that if the outfield bobbles it, 
then you can take off and wind up at second. So a very aggressive turn by Brett Lowry and I think that's one of the things that he'll bring to the park with him. Now Abreu takes strike one. It's really entertaining to watch him hit because since the time he has donned a major league uniform he has been a professional hitter. He understands what the pitcher is trying to do with him and he adjusts from pitch to pitch as well as anybody that I've seen come into this game. He's only been here two years. Where do you think that comes from with him. I think it's it's great training and I think it's a, a testament to his own professionalism wanting to be the best that he can be. Many times if you take a guy with great skills he doesn't understand that his great skills will only take him so far. Then you have to make adjustments. I think he learned how to make adjustments early. I think that when the English gets better than it is he's going to be a prolific team leader. That's been a big topic of discussion during the offseason the addition of Rick Renteria to the coaching staff as a help to Jose Abreu in communicating with the rest of his teammates. And for those of you not familiar with Rick. He was manager for the Chicago Cubs. Came over and he's certainly going to help Robin off the bench. He's a really good baseball man been around a long time. And I think they were looking for a little more communication with some of the. Spanish speaking players Rick can do that but overall he's just a good solid baseball man I don't think you can add enough of them to your program and he's one of the guys really going to help out this year found it away again forcing a fifth pitch from Hamill in the at bat another thing you have to bear in mind is without any clouds in the sky and we see that more times than not here in Arizona it's very difficult for the outfielders they call it a high sky there's nothing to contrast the baseball so you will see some terrible play at times in the outfield it's really no reflection how good or bad the outfielder is going to be you're looking at Jason Hayward who's one of the best outfielders in the game one and two and a breaking ball for strike three. Hamill back to his comfort pitch which is a slider. He gets a little more tilt on it meaning it goes down a lot more than most other pitchers sliders. But that was a good one. Because not only depth but change of speed had a bray you well out in front of him. The two down for maybe the headliner of the offseason coming to Chicago. Those are his numbers with the Reds. Todd Frazier in that three team deal a couple of months ago. Up the middle, Kawasaki's got it. And the Sox strand one in the first. No score after a half inning in Mesa.
lineup, Dexter Fowler at the top, Hayward and Candelario, the third baseman, the very talented young third baseman. Anthony Rizzo, John Andrioli, Tim Fedorovich, David Ross, and a double play combination of Christopher Negron and Munanori Kawasaki. Stoney, you have the defense in front of you. And the law firm of Garcia, Garcia, and Cabrera inhabit the outfield, along with Todd Fraser, Tyler Saladino, Brett Lawry, Jose Abreu, Alex Avila behind the plate, and Eric Johnson on the hill. Johnson 1 0. Didn't fare very well the first time out. But he's in a battle for that fourth starting spot or the one starting spot that's going to be inhabited by a right hand starter as opposed to the four lefties that are in the rotation. And Eric last year had a bounce back year. You see three and one is ERA three thirty four. He threw the ball very well at triple A came up to the major leagues worked more quickly had a a much more aggressive posture and it worked very well for him. So you root for a young guy who. Who came on some hard times in the major leagues only to bounce back and let's see what he's got today. Second start of the spring for Eric Johnson begins with a ball high to Dexter Fowler whose lone hit this spring has been one of the 16 Cubs home runs. By the way the law firm of Cabrera Garcia and Garcia they do torts right is that. Certainly torts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I would say. It's a pretty good outfield, pretty fast outfield. And with Leary Garcia and the flexibility that he provides, he's going to be bidding for one of the swing roles coming off the bench. And when you have a guy that can play everywhere, steal some bases for you, that's a pretty valuable man to have. On the ground, past second, Fowler is on with a leadoff single. Pretty interesting for Dexter Fowler because he was late to come to anybody's party as a free agent. And originally, everybody felt that on a three year deal, he was going to Baltimore. The only thing was, he never really agreed to the deal. And so, when everybody was talking about it, and Adam Jones, their great center fielder, was talking and welcoming him to the club, what he did was show up here at spring training with the Cubs and sneak behind the team and had a Cub uniform on. Everybody wondered if he was here just working out. Actually, he had signed a deal with the Cubs, and after a career year last year, he's back. Some of his teammates thought he was just stopping by to say goodbye from last year, and now he's back on the team. Pretty much a hello, I must be going, but instead, here he is as their center fielder. And he was he was very good last year for them. I think it was a career year for him. Fouled away by Hayward, nothing in two. There's a lot of people that feel that the Cubs overpaid for Jason Hayward. Well, overpaid is relative. Yes, he got a whole lot of money. But one of the things they wanted to do, and it was addition by subtraction, they took one of the key factors away from the St. Louis Cardinals. They got a guy who could play center field and right field, and they feel at 26, he's just coming into his own. Center field, Larry Garcia will let it drop in front of him. Fowler on his way to third. It's a hanging breaking ball, and that'll happen here in Arizona. That's one of the reasons why batting averages are so high. You get the hard infields is one, the high skies we've talked about, but the fact that breaking ball pitchers, guys that throw good curveballs, they're not going to break as much down here as they do in a place with high humidity. And so guys who depend on the curveball or a big breaking slider, they're not going to look quite as good as some of the fastballers here in Arizona. Now Jamer Candelario takes a strike. Young third baseman who the Cubs seem quite high on. Uh, as a pitcher, how much can you counteract the atmosphere here in Arizona when you're talking about leaving breaking balls up? What can you do? You can't really do anything. You just have to leave it to the baseball gods that maybe they'll hit something at somebody, and right here. Johnson needs a ground ball. It's a loud fly ball strike. 0 oh and 2. With first and third and nobody out, the whole pitching philosophy is stay out of the beginning. So you don't worry about the guy at third. If he scores, he scores. 
You think about throwing a ground ball, turning two, giving up the one run and stay out of the beginning, which keeps your team in the game. And that's what Eric is thinking about here. But he doesn't want to keep it on the inner portion of the plate as Candelario hit the daylights out of that last one. Considering the sequence, where do you go next on 0 and 2? If you trust your catcher, and Avila's a pretty good one, you bury a breaking ball in the dirt and hope you get a young hitter over anxious. But again, you have to trust your catcher, and Avila is just getting to learn Johnson. Johnson just getting to learn Avila. But if you have that confidence, that waste pitch might get you a strikeout. Set up inside on 0 and 2. Stayed up. And Candelario fouls it away. This is not what Alex had in mind when he called the fastball. He wanted it in under the hands. This ball drifts out over the plate. And fortunately, it's fouled straight back. Highly thought of receiver behind the plate, Alex Avila. Question with Alex, and the one that he keeps asking, will this be the year he stays entirely healthy? There they bury the breaking ball. Candelario stays off of it. Good stop by Avila. He went to school at Alabama, and he was so good calling pitches that the Alabama coach allowed him to call his own pitches, which in college is very rarely, if ever, done. It shows you the respect he had for the pitch calling ability of Avila as a very young catcher. And it's really held him in good stead because... In his years with Detroit, he handled some pretty tough pitchers to handle. Verlander at his peak, Scherzer certainly, guys who threw a lot of hard breaking balls in the dirt. He was able to do it very well, and obviously having some problems with concussions, and maybe that's the design of the new mask that is going to help that. One and two, and again blocked by Avila. Up to two pitches in the dirt and moving a hitter's eye level down. That face eye fastball is a good pitch to come back with. Good job by Avila. He shifted his body. He kept his elbows in. He leaned his body body forward. So when he blocked it, it trickled out in front of him. Inside three and two with Rizzo on deck. Now Hayward's a good base dealer and normally you might see him taking off here. I just don't think they're going to do it much in the spring. Want to make sure that he's healthy. He does not go and Johnson misses outside for ball four. See where Alex wants it. He wants it away. Johnson unfortunately misses with it, and even with a good job of framing, that pitch was a good three, four inches off the corner. So Don Cooper not liking the way this one is starting, but he realizes in spring training it's all about getting your work in, getting the amount of pitches in. And so although when the game started they might have wanted him to go four innings, throwing a a lot of first inning pitches might shorten that outing somewhat. Well, they're loaded now for Anthony Rizzo, who's got four hits, three for extra bases this spring. By the statistical measurement of wins above replacement, war, they call it, he was the most valuable batter for the Cubs last year, adding six wins. Well, you take that along with what they get at third base with Chris Bryant and they probably have as powerful a corner to some as anybody in baseball plus they're both young Bryant is getting better defensively as he plays more Rizzo is already accomplished defensively hard hit ball through the right side and the Cubs are on the board first Hayward around third it is two nothing
Rizzo has driven in his second and third runs of the spring. He's right on top of the plate. It's really difficult to get the ball inside. And when a pitcher is struggling with his control, as Eric Johnson is, Rizzo's up there looking one thing. He's looking fastball. He's looking for it out over the plate. He got it and drilled it through the right side. So here's John Andrioli, the left fielder in the fifth spot today. He lays down a bunt and gets the run in. Nobody covering first. Well done by Andrioli. That will bring a smile to any manager's face as he's able to execute, drive in his fourth run of the spring. It's a perfect bunt. And with Jose at first base, he's got to realize that this ball is not going all that far, trusting that Eric Johnson is going to get to it. But as it turned out, there was nobody home at first base. So still nobody out, two on for Fedorovich, the catcher. Cubs have another game tonight. They're playing at Camelback against the Dodgers, so some of the Cubs regulars are not in the lineup for this early game. It's a good thing. The other guys it, have done pretty well for themselves so far. At three to nothing so far. Yeah, you don't want to see those other guys in the game. Fedorovich to right field. Garcia on the warning track hauls it in. Rizzo to third. Inside out swing by Fedorovich, and this ball goes a long way. In fact, Avi was set up for it, still had to drift with it. This ball almost went out of the ballpark. That shows you how much carry there is here. This is a beautiful ballpark, Sloan Park. Cubs certainly enjoy being here, and the attendance would certainly be live at, seeing as just about each and every game they're drawing over 15,000. David Ross tips that one foul. <laughs> Nothing and one. Andrioli to second. Maybe Ross just swung through that. So second and third. One down off the steal by Andrioli. This is the last year for David Ross. He's a veteran catcher. Handles pitchers exceptionally well. Has been the personal catcher for John Lester. Pops this one up. Laurie fighting the sun does corral it for out number two. You said it. The high, high sky. sky. It's very difficult here. And at the last instant, the lunge backwards gets the job done. Sunglasses are an interesting piece of equipment for baseball well, players, they are, aren't and, they? And his hat absolutely saw that ball very well. But if you're going to wear them there, it becomes a little difficult on pop-ups. Arizona's statutory ban on clouds <laughs> comes into play again. Two down for Christopher Negron, and nothing in one. Major utility guy for the Cubs, Negron. It's going to be tough. There's probably one spot to be had on the bench for the Cubs. This is a young team, although they're quickly becoming veterans at a very young age, and consequently, spots are few and far between. They picked up Ben Zobrist. He's going to man second base for them, a huge free agent acquisition. Hayward, of course, another acquisition along with Lackey, all free agents. And so the Cubs' philosophy is interesting. Theo Epstein decided that a few years back he was going to go mostly with position players in the draft, figuring that either through free agency or through trades, he could build up his pitching staff. And that's exactly what's happened. But he has some excellent young position players. 
one and two on Negron, the eighth batter of the inning for the Cubs and Joe Madden. Joe is one of the most entertaining managers around. You and I had a chance to spend a lot of time with him before the game. He's a wealth of baseball knowledge. He's got some very definitive and very good ideas on how he wants to run his spring. Upstairs, two and two on the ground. I asked him if he had an overwhelming philosophy heading into spring training and then on to the season, what would it be? He said he wants his guys to be ready and healthy when the season starts, and the rest of it will take care of itself. Pretty simple idea when you get right down to it. Said he's going to start actually coaching some of the guys up next <laughs> week. He's been the overseer so far this spring. Twenty six pitch inning for Eric Johnson. A laborious first inning for Eric. It's been tough too. And tedious. But if he gets out with just three runs. He will consider it. Still a tough inning, but he'll be able to survive it. In the air to left, Cabrera is there. First five reach, next three retired, three nothing after one. Number 11 for both teams. We take a look at the offseason editions presented by Miller Lite. Who's the most important to you? And then go from there. Todd Fraser would be the most important because he brings another power bat to the lineup. Plus, he plays an exceptional third base. And they love him in the locker room because he seems to be able to get everybody together. He's a natural leader, and I think he's going to do great here. Brett Lowry's a good one because he certainly gives you a lot of enthusiasm. Hopefully, he can. Looks somewhat offensively like he did last year and defensively he can play a good solid second base. Uh, as far as some of the other additions uh, they left off the biggest one and of course that would be you. But not we, enough room there to drop down menu right. I think we could add. We'll take uh, Austin Jackson gives a lot of flexibility with Avila and Navarro both. A much better catching situation this year for the Sox and, and I think both of them are going to pay dividends. Avila certainly can hit the ball. And he's a terrific catcher. Navarro has shown this spring he's hitting everything in sight. If he hits anywhere close to that, it's going to be a huge addition. And there's a couple of other things that I wanted to tell you, but I wanted to wait through the first inning about the tradition we usually have with the newer guys in the spring. And uh -huh. that is that starting now, that you pay for every meal when we go out together. Well, this bottle of water here certainly is yours. Is that the, st is that the start Free. of it? Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate just that. got it from the, the pay cooler up here. I did notice however that you were able to. 
when your way through one of the deep fried pork sandwiches they have here at the ballpark. It was a demolition more than a wending. Ground ball to second. Kawasaki takes care of Cabrera one away. Let's take a look at that graphic once again. See there, yeah, it's nice. And you are you are there prominently at the bottom, only because we didn't have any room under that. No. But we also had Jimmy Rollins, Travis Ishikawa, Matt Latos, who is a guy that they would love to see in competition for that fourth or right-handed starting spot. And Latos threw today in a B game. There you look at Todd Fraser, one of the guys that. Everybody's really enjoying this spring. And if he hits 35 again, they're really going to enjoy it. Yeah, he's from Tom's River, New Jersey. Frazier is, but he kind of has a Chicago sensibility about him. The way he approaches the game of baseball and, and how gregarious he is with with the other players. I mean, he is the life of the party in the clubhouse. Just watching him at Sox Fest and how he interacted with the other players and the fans, you got a feeling that he understands it. Not a lot of players do, especially coming to a new team for the first time with all the hopes and dreams that everybody has for Todd Fraser. There's no doubt when you're last in hitting home runs and you're last in runs scored, you need some offense. Fraser's going to provide that, but he's also going to provide the much needed defense at third base. Well, he won the home run contest and not only him, but the whole team has put together a significantly more powerful spring already with 20 home runs. And you would imagine that would translate to the regular season better than maybe some other things in spring. Home runs aren't just going to go away. Well, this team has more power. Yeah. And last year, when you take a look at what happened with the ball club early, everybody got off to a slow start. So that was a good slider, and Dobby goes down. If you stay around the plate, whether it's Rob Drake as the umpire or anybody else, the more you stay around the plate, the more calls you're going to get. You see Fedorovic setting up outside. It's a pretty decent pitch, actually, and certainly close enough, too close to take. So Hamill looks like the guy who started the season for the Cubs last year. And, you know, when you start out with the Cy Young Award winner and Jake Arrieta was unbelievable last year. I don't think, and he doesn't even know if he can even live up to anything close to what he did last year where he's unhittable. And you add Lackey as a number three behind John Lester. The top three are actually reminiscent of what the Sox have for the top three. You get Chris Sale. He certainly is outstanding. That's all you can say. Most underrated pitcher in the game is Jose Quintana. Not a whole lot of people have heard about him. He just goes out, gives you a quality start. And then you got Carlos Rodon, who's looked great this spring. Threw very well yesterday, Rodon. In a game, he didn't even throw a slider. He just left the slider back in Glendale and was working away from it and still went for tremendous innings against San Diego. And the key with him is going to be that straight change, and that's what Don Cooper has tried to impart on the youngster is get that straight change, get the command of it, be able to move it both sides of the plate if you can, but throw it for strikes because the slider is unhittable. That's a non-debatable pitch. If he gets you down in the count, the slider will wipe you out. Breaking ball got away from Hamill that time. One and two on Avila. Two down to the Sox second. We're not going to have a chance to see Addison Russell today, but he is probably destined to hit 25 home runs at shortstop. And one of the better guys around, not flashy at all, but they got him in a deal that sent Jason Hamill and Jeff Samarja to Oakland. So they use a couple of their pitchers to get their number one prospect in Addison Russell. He came over with Billy McKinney. But Russell's one of those guys they thought was ticketed for second base because Starlin Castro was their shortstop. They realized very quickly that Russell was not as spectacular but much more dependable and could really hit. And he's just in the infancy stages of what appears to be a terrific career. They move Castro and end up with Adam Warren, who's going to be an important part of that staff this season. Three and two on Avila working the count. He's walked four times already this spring. Alex has been a dead pull hitter most of his career, and the oddity is when we've seen him in Detroit hitting the ball to left center, that's when he's been at his best. If he can get that stroke down, well, that's something I'm sure Todd Steverson is talking to him about. Nice pitch, strike three. Back-to-back -back punch outs for Hamill. He's retired five in a row. Comes to the bat rack after one and a half.
the only Cub we didn't see in the first inning. Munanori Kawasaki, then Fowler and Hayward scheduled. Kawasaki has a lot of mannerisms mm. of Ichiro Suzuki, but obviously a little more limited. But at times we saw him with Toronto as a pretty decent player. He can do a mean backflip as well. Very dexterous. I would say if you look at the workouts, and I have been around a lot of the Japanese teams as they do their workouts and stretching, you can understand why they would be dexterous because they uh, they spend a lot of time loosening up, a lot of time with the stretching exercises, and just a lot of time working out overall. It's it's a completely different way to play baseball than we see here. One and two on Kawasaki. So here, Eric Johnson face eight batters in the first inning, but it calms down as the inning goes on. Now two and two on Kawasaki. How do you go into the uh, the dugout? What do you say to Don Cooper? What does he say back to you? Pretty much, he says that what's done is done. Go out and give me a good inning. Keep your pitches down, throw strikes, and don't worry about what happened. And that's. What you have to do because he doesn't have any part of last inning. He made a couple of mistakes, but again, that's part of the learning process. Don Cooper, one of the best there is, and you can take pitchers who have not lived up to their promise in other places, bring them to Chicago, and Don will get the most out of them. Kawasaki to left to the fading line drive into the glove of Cabrera for out number one. Elke was in the right spot. And fortunately, on that sinking line drive, he was able to make the play. Good effort. I was talking about the start of last season. It's almost incomprehensible that Cabrera and Eaton and Garcia all would get off to as slow a start as they did. Most of the guys, Lexi Ramirez at shortstop, got off to a terribly slow start. Nothing really worked well, and consequently, the offense put so much pressure on the pitching staff that things didn't work out very well. I would think with the configuration of this team and the additions that Rick Hahn made, the offense is going to be a whole lot better. Well, just with more flexibility, we saw on the list that we showed you the last half inning, Austin Jackson is in the fold as well. He's in camp, hasn't played the game yet. He gives you the option of putting somebody in center if somebody's in a slump on the other side of the, the roster card. And with Adam LaRoche hurt to this point, having some back issues, you think about the flexibility of who to DH. Well hit by Fowler, deep to right field and gone. Seventeenth Cub home run this spring. That's one of the reasons why they were so happy to get Dexter Fowler back. Fowler, a switch hitter, probably a better hitter from the right side. Certainly more power from the left side. And we take a look at what he did last year. You realize that if not a career year, that's the Dexter Fowler they want to see because he hit the ball out of the park with more regularity than he has during the course of his career. And he played, if not a great center field, he played a solid center field for them. I don't think anybody would say he's a great center fielder. But they were fully prepared to have Hayward play center field until they re-signed Fowler. And now, of course, all is right with the Cub outfield. Two and one on Hayward, who singled and scored back in the first. You don't find many younger free agents than Jason Hayward. 26 years old, he was out there for the taking. In the air to right, Avi Garcia is on the case for out number two. Hey, Sox fans, don't miss your chance to be entered in our March to Opening Day sweepstakes by having your group outing paid in full. You'll have the chance to win one of 18 amazing prizes, which vary from autograph items to diamond suites to a round-trip vacation and more. Visit whitesocks.com slash march to learn more. Thank you. You Thank folks you. can't see it, but I just gave 
Jason, a standing ovation for one of the great reads that I have heard. And the best part about it is that I don't have to read it because I was very, very bad at that. You were? Yes. Your literacy is in question? It was a hole in my game. Ball to strike <laughs> on Candelario. I'm glad the copy said it's a round trip vacation. I was going to assume that he's just going to send you one way. It, and that's make your way back that, home. That's part of the charm of that vacation. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a getaway. We can send you there. Two and one from Johnson to Candelario. That is no fun. This is what happens if your hands are pretty quick. You hit it off the instep of your front foot. Now I can say in the many times that I did go to bat where I was in the National League, I never fouled a ball off my foot because my hands were never that quick. Got to make contact to foul it off your foot. Wait, I hit 100. That is a fair ball. And it is a ground rule double for Candelario. You hit 100 what? I hit 100 right on the nose. That was my batting average lifetime. And I had one hit taken away as you see this ball just inside the line slicing away from Malky. At Pine Tower on my batting gloves and grabbed the bat on the label. And a Dodger catcher by the name of Steve Yeager ratted me out to the umpire who, after a base hit to center field pointed at me and it was an ignominious walk back to the dugout, and I was embarrassed on top of it. And I lost a base hit, which would have pushed me probably to 103. But I did hit triple digits, which I'm very happy about. A point of pride. Absolutely. Rizzo, the two-run single back in the first. Sprays that one foul. Uh, Eric Johnson, you said, I mean, he's he's in the mix here to be one of the starters for the Sox. Matt Latos involved. He pitched in a B game earlier today in surprise against the Rangers. And John Danks in the rotation, too, after the top three lefties. I would think this is one of the competitions of the spring. Again, and a team that doesn't have too many competitions, this would be one. Shortstop would be another. Jimmy Rollins invited to spring training because of his experience has shown that he's got a little play left. And I think he's pushing Tyler Saladino, who a lot of people felt was the everyday guy. Now that's a matter of debate. Talking with Robin, and I know Rickon feels the same way. They're going to take the best guys they can and head north with it, hoping to get off to a very good start this year. Because when you look at the division and you evaluate what teams did, Cleveland didn't spend a whole lot of money and really hasn't improved their offense. They've got good pitching. Minnesota's really young. Minnesota has some bangers, but again, they haven't done much with their pitching, but they've got some good hitters, especially the young Korean, who looks really good. Sano's going to play the outfield this year. They get some guys who can swing the bat. Dozier has been a revelation at second base, and so along with Plouffe getting better and better at third, they look pretty good, but I don't think they're going to get a whole lot of people out, and that's going to be the big problem with them. Kansas City, the defending World Series championship team, is not as good as they were last year, although getting Gordon back as a free agent and not letting him go someplace else, that was a big addition to that team. Ian Kennedy's really yeah. interesting. Well, right? their pitching is the question mark. Yeah. If their pitching holds up with that bullpen, they're going to be pretty good, although not a lot of people will tell they're going to be as good as last year. And Detroit, they're going to have some difficulties. Swing and a miss, Johnson. Gets himself out of the second inning. Cubs get one more on the Fowler home run, and we are too deep in Mason.
Eaton to bat. And we are joined from downstairs by the skipper of the Sox, Robin Ventura. Hello, Robin. Hello. How are you doing? Tremendous. How are you? Fantastic. What you got for us right now? Two innings deep. Two innings deep. We need a couple runs. Uh, we'll take uh, take two this inning. Fight back. That's what Steve wants. We need to drive ourselves back into this game and probably start with Saladino. What do you like so far about the battle at shortstop between Rollins and Saladino? I think it's been a it's a it's a healthy one. You know, I think Jimmy comes in with a lot of experience. Uh, you know that that's the kind of stuff I think when he came in you're looking at him uh, as an older player but just his presence his work habits uh, instant respect throughout the clubhouse so and, and he's been playing well I think that's that's the biggest thing he came in in great shape what can he do for Tyler I think there's a lot of things you can do I think when you're when you're that experienced and you've been around uh, you know I think he can slow the game down for Tyler uh, playing shortstop in the big leagues of uh, the plays that he makes his arm's not as strong as it used to be, but he can get himself into position that uh, haven't been around a while. He can still get people out by half step. Robin, this is the first game that we've telecast this spring, and obviously there's certain signposts as the spring moves along. What do you like so far about this team, even though it is relatively early? I think they're a third of the way through the spring. Well, it's a different group. I mean, you know, we've been pretty young the last few years uh, within our infield, and I think we've somehow gotten to our point to uh, get some veterans in there in there that uh, it's just been a different feel all the way around I think from the first time that we stepped on the field uh, defensively and coming with it offensively as well on the ground at first and save Garcia beat it out certainly like to see that don't you Robin I do I do Lurie's had a nice little spring here I mean I, I think he's a guy that plays all over today he's out in center field uh, you know with with Adam not being able to play out in center field we've kind of had a rotating guy out there and uh, you know he, he's had a lot more opportunities probably than he normally would play in center field. How do you like the catching situation this year you have two new guys back there Navarro is hitting the daylights out of it and Avila one of the better defensive catchers around but you've got a completely new look behind the plate. It is it is a new look and uh, you know those guys are veteran guys and I think just their comfort level behind the plate. Uh, you know, talking with Coop the other day of, of going through them, they have really gotten in tune with our pitchers very quickly. Uh, you know, with Sale, Sale, Rodon, uh, Q, it, it's in Danks. You know, it, it's the, those first guys that that they've caught. It's been great. I think uh, you know they've gotten in tune with them, and it's been a nice little uh, thing to watch. Even yesterday with Rodon, he went through it without throwing too many sliders because he's really working on. Uh, his change up and command with his fastball. And he, was, he was fantastic out the honor, you know, took him through that uh, really like a pro. And I think even Carlos looked like he'd been around for about five years. And Robin, you're still a very young manager as far as years that you've been at the helm. But can you imagine a better situation with the flexibility you have just about everywhere on the ball club than the White Sox and you have this year. Yeah this has been the most versatile team I've had as far as guys being, being able to move around the infield. Uh, some guys can play infield and outfield switch hitters. Uh, you know it's it's something that a lot of questions come up towards the end of spring training because of who we have who the movable pieces are that uh, it's, it's been a nice. Uh, spring as far as just trying to figure out who's going to play where and, and how they can move around. I think even during the season, just the options that you have, whether it's left or right, or you know, somebody might come up with something that they need two days instead of two weeks, that you can you can uh, fill that gap fairly easily. So for fans that haven't met him, what's your description of Todd Frazier and uh, his ability in the clubhouse? It, he's a he's a breath of fresh air. I think he, he's just a guy that um, it, if if you would go have an adult beverage somewhere, he could you could slide up to him very easily and have a conversation. And I think he fits into any group that we have in the clubhouse. Um, you know, puts himself in the middle of a lot of things and not forcefully so. I think guys, he's uh, he invites that in. Well, you said you wanted to get two in the inning, but that's not well. They only get one, six to four on the fielder's choice, and Lori will bat. Here in the third. Oh, 
Eaton Hussing down the line able to beat the play at first and Robin last year nobody had to tell you that there was a power outage among the ball club. This year you're starting out hitting the ball out of the ballpark. Is there any way that that translates with the good early start from the power department and the runs driven in into the regular season and hopefully getting off to a faster start. Well I think you know last year we didn't hit very well down here and I think that translated into the season so. Uh, you know there, there's been teams that have done it that have come into spring training and gotten hot and then just carried it all the way through but we also have people that you know in their past have hit homers so these are the same people that are hitting them now uh, I, I think it's just gotten started a little bit earlier I think from our um, our last couple seasons I think guys came in here and they've been going out from from day one you know there's really not been a whole lot of easing into it uh, they've been getting after it pretty good. We talked about the flexibility with this roster. What does that do for you as a manager? Well, I think, you know, in any situation that comes up, if you want to, you know, play the left right, uh, you, you have the ability to do that. I think uh, as, as far as going through the season, you know, there's, there's days when a lot of guys need maybe one or two days instead of uh, two weeks to go on the DL, and, and you can give them, you can give them that. You know, if there's a guy that just needs a rest, you can do that. Uh, but th these guys aren't just guys that are versatile and can go play all over. They they play it uh, above average, and they also have something offensively that they can uh, bring to the table. Did I hear you went to Springsteen the other night? I did, I did. I I I go to that quite often. Uh, th that's a good night. How was he? He was fantastic. He, he, I mean, I've never been there when he hasn't been. Up back line drive. Lori is finished here in the third. Robin, thank you for the time. All right, guys. Robin Ventura, skipper of the White Sox. After two and a half, it's four nothing Cubs. Official White Sox MasterCard debit card only available at your local Wintrust Community Bank. Go to Wintrust.com slash Sox to learn more. Member FDIC. If you were to ask any manager around the major leagues what they wanted to accomplish in spring training, probably number one, come out of it as healthy as possible because you can never predict injuries. And one team last year that had a remarkable run of injury free games was the Chicago Cubs. They won 97 games. Health was not a factor most of the year. And you can never predict how it's going to be in the coming year. So for the Cubs, that was one of the keys last year. That and having some youngsters come to the major leagues, youngsters that they knew were promising, but nobody believed that they were going to be as great as they were. Chris Bryant came up, won Rookie of the Year. Schwarber. Schwarber was outstanding. By the way, he's got a knee problem. Likely out until Sunday at the very earliest. Andrioli splits the gap and turns on the Jets around second, fourth, third leadoff triple for John Andrioli. He came in hitting 091. So apparently, he has found whatever he's been missing this spring. And with a perfect bunt and now a line drive triple to right center field. He's trying to do what 
every guy not ticketed for a starting role tries to do in spring training is show the intelligentsia that he can play. He can give him some flexibility, play a few different positions, and having a very good day today. Triple A rookie last year, his first season in Iowa last season. And he's on third against Derek Johnson for Fedorovich, one of a couple guys in this lineup that came through the Red Sox organization. Fedorovich, Anthony Rizzo, originally a Red Sox. Negron as well in the eighth position. I wonder why that was. I wonder who might have been hmm. associated with that organization for a while. Infield in for the Sox, and Fedorovich takes strike one. Certainly Theo has done a great job since coming over. He pretty much spelled out his game plan when he became a member of the Chicago Cubs and that was build from within before you spend money on free agents and he was able to do exactly that. To shortstop nice pick Saladino and it keeps Andreoli at third. Well, you know about Saladino's defense. He's got excellent hands. He's got a very strong arm, and he got what you have to get when you bring the infield in, and that's get the ground ball. He also is testing the baseball mustache waters. I said to him the other day, nice mustache, and he said, well, you're the first person that said that. And I thought about rescinding my nice mustache. I was the only person on board with it. It's an interesting muscle. Mm. It's very politically correct of you. And that is a balk. And one of the reasons why it is a balk is because in the interpretation of the umpires, he was throwing to an unoccupied base. As it turned out, it was about a 30-foot toss. As you can see, Fraser drifts off the bag. Consequently, you're throwing to an unoccupied base. So that'll go as a run scored and a lesson learned for a young pitcher. Figure out where your infielders are going to be before you use a pickoff mode. So you're saying that's more Johnson's responsibility than Frazier's? Yes. Because I doubt that there was any sign saying let's go over to third base. I think Johnson just decided for whatever reason that he wanted to shorten up the lead of Andrioli. Instead he scores. Fouled away by Ross ball and a strike from Eric Johnson 55 pitches deep into his second spring outing. The first one was last Monday two innings a couple of earned runs against the Angels. You know Ross is going to end up and it could be with the Cubs. He's going to end up as a pretty valuable coach before his run of wearing a major league uniform is over as a player. This is going to be the last year. But as a coach he has tremendous value. Just dropped out of the zone two and two for Ross. One of the other guys one of the most important guys that Theo brought over. Was Jason McLeod who's the senior vice president of scouting and player development and Scouting and player development have to work hand in hand if you're going to bring quality players to the major leagues consistently. That's one of the big problems. Hey, Sox fans, opening day is Friday, April 8th at 3.10 p.m. versus the Indians. All fans ages 21 and over will get a 2016 White Sox magnetic schedule presented by Miller Lite, the original light pilsner and official beer of your Chicago White Sox. Purchase your tickets today by visiting whitesox.com or calling 866-SOX-GAME. It's going to be an interesting start to the season only in that it starts in Oakland. That starts on the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th with four away games. Then home for a very short series with Cleveland. No off days. And then it's on to Minnesota for four, for three rather, and then Tampa Bay. And so... Two of the first three series are on the road. It's essential that the Sox get off to a good start, and they're going to have to do it as road warriors because home games until the end of April are scarce. 
Two balls and a strike on Negron. Are you going to bring me back some memento from every road ballpark that I don't go to this year? I'm doing the home games, Hawks doing the road games. I, I am. Will you bring me a gift I have, back? I've already planned to do that. I'm going to bring you back my expense report, and you will then be able to reimburse me for some of the finer restaurants that I'll eat at on the road. So if I'm not calling pitches in the sixth inning, folks, it means I'm in the back of the booth scanning receipts. Well, you'll, you'll also be then given the opportunity to experience, if just tangentially, my culinary trip through the American League cities. Breaking ball for strike three. And one more across for the Cubs. More after this. Work or boost morale. Steve Stone will drop by to do that portion of it. Companies, schools, churches, and sports teams can all enjoy special group benefits when they reserve 20 or more seats. The larger your group, the larger your discount to purchase. Visit whitesocks.com slash group, just as it says on the screen there. Five nothing Cubs after three, Stoney. Second time through, and hopefully they'll figure out how the slider breaks and maybe catch up with a couple of fastballs. Because the first time through yielded just two singles, one by Lowry and one by Garcia, and that's been it. His handles look pretty good so far. And again, you got a guy who throws a slider, it actually breaking pretty well for Arizona. And so far, he's uh, he's mystified some of the Sox hitters. Abreu went down on strikes the first time on five pitches. The Cubs do have one decision, and that is to go with. An eight man pitching staff or go with an extra hitter off their bench. Managers usually like the extra hitter. Abreu in the air to right for Hayward and one down. And you would imagine there's going to be a flexible pitching staff no matter what for Chris Fazio. Chris Fazio getting high praise from Joe Madden before the game where he was saying that he allows. And encourages Chris to pretty much take over all of the pitching and all decisions to be made. Certainly, they're made as a cooperative effort between the two, but the fact that pitching coach and the manager can work together, along with Dave Martinez, who is a former Cub player, was a very good player in his time. And Joe Madden before the game said that he's absolutely astonished that Dave Martinez has not had a managerial job. He felt he was going to lose him after last year. He was kind of surprised at the scarcity of interviews, but he figures that Dave is ready to manage in the major leagues now, just hasn't had the opportunity. And his praise couldn't be more effusive before the game because he really respects Dave, who was his bench coach when he was at Tampa Bay.
two and one on Frazier. You know, we've talked about Todd Frazier and how he is in the clubhouse, and he said it this offseason, talking about his time in the Little League World Series, dating back to when he was before teenage years, he was used to just talking to people and being glib, essentially, and using that personality to to better his position and, and better his team's position. So, I mean, he's been he's been doing this for 17, 18 seasons as a big-time baseball player, whether it be on a big stage for a little guy or now a big stage for a big guy. Well, he comes over with a lot of confidence from his years with Cincinnati and certainly a whole lot of ability. And I have found over the course of my career that a guy is never funnier than when he's driving in over 100 runs and hitting over 30 home runs. The jokes land. They uh, they do real well. You can be you can't be much of a team leader if you're hitting 110 and driving in four runs. Foul of third for Frazier. But the influence he's had so far and again it's just it's very early in the spring. You could see it at Sox Fest. You can see what kind of person he was. Everybody who understood his exploits last year realized what kind of player he was and I think they're hugely surprised defensively at third base. Yeah. Fastball from Hamill is his fourth strikeout. Two down in the fourth. We're throwing a lot of sliders. You can go to the high fastball and get away with it and that's become a pitch that's used more and more frequently with guys especially with a breaking ball you get the hitter looking down you get him looking in a certain area you elevate your fastball you're able to throw it by him even though you don't have an overwhelming fastball the term you hear thrown around a lot now is changing the eye level for the batter that's exactly what happens when you use that face eye fastball it's a pitch called higher than high you don't want it to strike you want it just out of the zone making it tantalizing and then guys swing through it Kawasaki Easy does it to first. One, two, three inning for Jason Hamill. He's done very well today in Mesa. Three and a half done. Cubs in the lead by a nickel. By Nissan. Choose Nissan.com. And there you see the series with Oakland in Oakland leading off the season. It's going to be Sonny Gray pitching that first game for the Athletics. Oakland with high hopes. They just want to stay healthy. I talked with a few of the people from Oakland. They said so far the team is healthy and they would certainly love to see Sonny Gray put together two strong halves. They felt he weared down last year, but wore down last year. And he's a good one. As Dan Jennings comes into the game, you can never have too many left handed relievers. There are the numbers last year in 53 games. ERA just below four. Bonin sitting 256, not all that bad. He only allowed three home runs. Back to back Berkeley guys on the mound for the Sox. Eric Johnson went to Cal. Dan Jennings born in Berkeley. 
And Kawasaki in his second at bat after a line out to left the first time. You mentioned the ace. Rich Hill, interestingly enough, coming back to the majors, trying to stretch out, become a starter again after going from starter to reliever and then coming through the minors with the Red Sox back to the majors and back to starter now. At least that's the idea. He was a former number one draft pick of the Cubs. And at that point, he threw straight over the top with a big curveball. He had some problems getting it over the plate. And eventually, he found some success in the major leagues as a pensman. So if he can make that conversion back with some of the problems that Oakland has had, notably to Jared Parker. And for those of you that didn't hear, Jared Parker, who has battled a lot of arm problems, two Tommy John surgeries, one fractured elbow, Fractured his right elbow a second time, and that probably is career threatening, perhaps career ending. And that's one of the things you truly hate to see is a guy not able to fulfill the great potential he had dating back to his days with the Diamondbacks because physically he just can't hold together. So we wish Jared Parker well, a very tough injury. And from a pitching standpoint, Oakland could use one more start. Sox will see the A's that first series of the season, then home for Cleveland for three, as you mentioned. Off to the road again for Minnesota and Tampa before the longest homestand of April starts after that. The shortstop, Saladino makes it look easy. One down. You got to make sure you're in position to get this throw off because Kawasaki runs pretty well. And Tyler going into the hole realized you have to have your footwork just right to get the ball off as quickly as possible. So he gets it there in plenty of time. Actually beats him by a step and a half. Good solid play by Saladino. And for a man that can play just about anywhere in the infield. He's trying to stake his claim to the everyday starting shortstop job. But it's going to be a battle this spring. Jimmy Rollins not on this trip, but has played extensively. Here's Dexter Fowler, who last time up took the first pitch he saw and blasted off. He got just about every bit of it. And here in Arizona, you don't have to get much. There's a whole lot of people sitting down, enjoying this game from the outfield perspective. Once Jennings again, for round number two. A sellout, probably over 15,000 here today. Tough to find a spot out on that berm right now. You couldn't fit a family of four in most of those spots in between the Colts out there in the outfield. They were able to build a beautiful field here, calling it Sloan Park. It's really right at the triangle, triangle between Scottsdale, Tempe, and Mesa. In Mesa, however. Looking through the Sox former spring training homes earlier today. The Sox trained back in the 1900s, one year in Mexico City. During the war, they were in Indiana for a couple of years in French Lick and a few other ports of call in Texas for a while, Sarasota, of course, and then Tucson until. Uh, Glendale a couple of years ago when I played for the Sox two different times 73 against 77 78 the training home was Sarasota and it was just absolutely beautiful down there you know, in recent years it seems like more teams have been trying to move to Arizona simply because of the ease of travel as compared to the Florida State League. If you figure out just how long you spend on the bus going from the east side of Florida to the west side, you'll realize how much less time you have to actually work out. I just love it down here. And again, for pitchers, it isn't ideal. Hitters love it. But for pitchers, they would prefer the humidity and the breaking ball breaks a little better in Florida. But the weather is much more consistent here. And now, with these parks that are inhabited by two teams like the Dodgers and the Sox in Glendale, you have 14 fields. You have more than enough room to do whatever it is you need to do. Ball four, Jennings walks Hayward with two out.
don't forget, you can provide your guests with the ultimate all-inclusive White Sox experience. The home plate club or Magellan scout seats. These two premium seating areas are the best way to entertain your most important clients, employees, friends, or family. For more information, 312-674-1000 or visit whitesox.com slash premium seating. My dear friend Don Vogel is back in the booth. He works with security here at Sloan Park. He was the man that provided those wonderful pork sandwiches for you. Up the middle into center, another base hit for Candelario. And they go first to third with Hayward. And because this is his people's Sabbath, I told him that I would collect the money for the pork sandwiches and transfer it to him at a later date. The other side of that bus is pretty greasy up there. I, as I recall, I did make the offer and I was waved off by your friend, Mr. Vogel. Truth be told. Well, I did notice that in looking at the gear you have worn this spring, uh -huh. that you're one of the few people that gets his pants made with his pockets sewn shut. So the offer was just simply that, an offer. You know, it's cheap to have the tailor do that, though. <laughs> One more at bat for Rizzo, who singled home two in his first trip up and he takes strike one. This is one of the things that Rizzo has done to improve his game and become one of the dominant sluggers in all of baseball and that is improve the at-bats against left-handers and the key is keeping the right shoulder in. You can't open up too quickly. He's right on top of the plate pretty much daring you to get the ball inside and he's shown conclusively that he can hit anybody with just about any pitch. He's still going to strike out a lot but he's pretty tough. Sox are playing him significantly to pull on the infield with three to the right of second base. Rizzo five hits so far this spring. And there you see against lefties 294 righties 272 last year. And although much more power against the right handers when you're hitting close to 300 lefty on lefty you're doing a real good job of it. Ball gets through Avila and Hayward scores. Very good chance of that being a pass ball. We'll have to see exactly how it's scored. Yeah, that's probably going to be a wild pitch. That ball was in the dirt, and it is scored a wild pitch. Avila did not get down to block it, and yet another Cub run. Cubs have scored in every trip to the plate so far. This continues. You and I are going to be sent home. Not exactly an auspicious beginning to cool. spring training televised games. Yeah. Two and one from Jennings. Up the ladder on the left side. Frazier gives way to Saladino, and that'll do it for the Cubs here in the fourth. Wild pitch gets another run for the Cubs. They lead 6 0.
interesting weekend at U.S. Cellular Field. First 20,000 fans on Saturday, April 9th get a White Sox winter hat presented by Comcast Sportsnet. Visit WhiteSox.com to purchase your tickets today. You're going to model those for us, aren't you? No, I, I believe that that for you would be a great look. Mm, thank you. You realize how chilly it has a chance to be, but not with one of those hats. Well, 49 today in Chicago, I was told, at first pitch time here. Here's Aaron Brooks, who the Cubs got in the Chris Coghlan deal. They got him from Oakland. Coghlan was a very good player last year, and Brooks comes over. You look at the numbers. Not a particularly good year, but they believe that he's got a chance to be pretty good. He came out of the Kansas City organization originally. Ninth round draft pick in 2011. Acquired by Oakland. Javi Garcia to third and beat it out. Good hustle on the part of Garcia. Now we'll have to see if he runs himself into a base hit or they charge E5. Not an easy pickup for Candelario. And good hustle. Keeps him at first base. Well, Avi's had a pretty good spring. He came into this game nine for 17. Three doubles, a triple, and a homer. And part of that outfield now seems to be rotation with Austin Jackson being added. We'll see how it shakes down. It's a big spring for Avi and obviously a very big year for him. He still has yet to live up to all of the potential. And now with the Cubs going into their radical shift, it opens up the left side of the infield if Alex should choose to go that way. Don't even need that shortstop position on camera here. All four infielders near second base or to the right of it. So it was indeed E5. No base hit for Garcia. Well, one thing that's interesting about Avi Garcia is we're not talking about somebody who's had that many full major league seasons under his belt. And he's a huge guy, so he looks older and more experienced than he actually is. Didn't look like a real good pitch, and I think Alex is a little unhappy in the call by Rob Drake, but Aaron Brooks picks up a strikeout looking. You can understand where Alex would be a little unhappy. That ball looked about three, four inches off the outside corner, but it's spring training for the umpires also. And you're not going to be able to do much with that one anyway. So one down, one on, and Saladino's second trip to the plate. Here at the top of the fifth. And that one gets away. Saladino drew the bunt back. Garcia up to second. It's a wild pitch. That has to be a. And they might have charged a wild pitch, but that's a pass ball. And it looked like a splitter. And they did change it to a pass ball. It could very well be that Fedorovich isn't particularly used to Brooks. It looked like if he called a splitter, he wasn't prepared for it because that ball had some good sink on it and got away from it. Couple of California guys here. Aaron Brooks out of San Bernardino. Tyler Saladino makes his home in San Diego. Tough life out there to live in San Diego, isn't it? Beautiful place. Big ballpark. Good place if you're a pitcher, not so much if you're a hitter. Sox wore out the Padres yesterday. Four homers in the game on the road in Peoria. Padres are going to have some problems this year. They got a pretty good division. The Diamondbacks 
slated probably for third place, but feel they're a little bit better than that. And of course, you've got the Giants and the Dodgers, two very strong teams. Colorado doesn't have much pitching. You could say that just about every year. Very much so. But the Padres have a new shortstop, Alexei Ramirez. John Jay out in the outfield. Three and one from Brooks to Saladino. And he gives it a ride. Foul. Three and two. I'd be interested to see the rotation of the shortstop position here. Saladino and Rollins, you talked about it. What do you think it comes down to? What do you think the decision gets based on? Well, initially, you would think that it would come down to who had the best spring, but I don't think that's really the consideration. I think they both make the ball club, and it depends on what capacity, and I don't think it's, it's determined yet. Saladino has a pretty good upside. A very young player. He's got some speed. He has some talent. I think he's a little stronger than people actually think he is. So he'll hit a few more home runs. Rollins, with just outstanding talent, has been a great player for a long time. The question is just exactly what he has left. Well, the question is when you talk about Saladino's power. You got the 2011 season in high A with Winston Salem, and I know it's different than the majors, but 26 doubles, nine triples, 16 homers. He slugged 501 that season. Those are big numbers. Those are very big numbers. And last year, at times, he surprised a few of the American League starters because he hit the ball pretty well, and he hit it a long way. Fouled <laughs> off again, and he will see. An eighth pitch from Brooks. I like this at bat because Brooks has been going in, out, up, and down, has yet to get it by Tyler. Garcia at second, one down as the Sox try to scratch across their first run of the ball game. To center field, Fowler. Won't get there, it's over his head. Saladino drives home Garcia. The Sox are on the board. Here's our four drive of the game, and without a whole lot to choose from, we'll take a line drive to center field, and this is a fastball down the middle. Dexter Fowler takes a bad step. He comes in, and again, it's really tough to judge a ball hit right over your head, especially in Arizona. Doubtful if he gets to it anyway. As it accelerated, it was going one hop against the wall. And that's the fourth run driven in this spring by Tyler Saladino, who had a very good battling at bat, and he won the battle. Eight pitches to the double for Saladino. Garcia flares it out to center and Fowler got a great jump that time two down There was no way Andrioli was going to make this play so Dexter Fowler comes over taking a look Making sure that there is no collision in left center field, then calling for it at the last instant, taking it just off the top of the grass and making the play. Very difficult for outfielders here. One more trip to the plate for Adam Eaton. We had a nice charity event here in Arizona last night. Some of his teammates were guest bartenders for his foundation. Jose Abreu is there, among others. Oh, and two. It's funny listening to Adam talk about playing the DH position, which is a position, really. He's not in the outfield. He says, look, I'm just annoying everybody in the dugout. 
They get sick of me. I get sick of talking to myself. I want to go play the field. He's a ball of energy. Well, coming back from the shoulder issue, you don't really know when he's going to be ready to go yet. The last thing the Sox want is to rush him along and re injure that shoulder. But he's getting his at bats, which is what he's got to do. And what I like about his game today, although it's not going to show up as a major factor, is he stole second base. Something he's had some trouble doing, but something that he wants to work on. And when you get to the point when you're a veteran player, it comes down all to technique as opposed to just flat out speed. And he's got to work on technique. Checked his swing, and he did go around. Brooks, a pair of strikeouts in the inning. Garcia scores on the Saladino double at 6 1 halfway home. The 2016 season for free T-shirt Thursday. First 10,000 fans at every White Sox regular season home game get a specially designed White Sox T-shirt. To purchase your free T-shirt Thursday tickets, visit WhiteSox.com. Tyler Saladino doubles home Javi Garcia. And that's the first run on the board for the Sox in the top of the fifth. And we got to go to the pitcher. bullpen again. Jake Patrichka, we will wait to show you his numbers from last year, and they were pretty good. Jake's got a great arm. Last year, four and three ERA, three sixty three. He was called on to save three games. He was successful twice. And the batting average, opponent's batting average against him isn't the best. That's largely because of walks. And that rifled down the line, and hopefully everybody comes away unscathed. What do you think of the new Major League Baseball suggestions and rules about netting in the ballparks? Good for safety. I think it's terrific for safety. The question then becomes will fans get used to it? And I think the fans who already sit behind home plate and have the safety of that net feel pretty good about it. Up the middle off Patrichka. And there is no netting that can keep that from happening. I think Jake caught a break. And I say it's a break because this ball could have easily gotten a good piece of the throwing hand or just flat out hit him in the head. He rolls off the mound and he appears to be healthy. Trans staff will come out and take a yeah, look. They're going to come out and, and find out if he is okay. 
One of the things that's really changed, Jason, in the game, maybe the last 20 years, is the fact that pitchers, when they follow through, they don't square off their follow through. In an effort to throw harder, they fall off the mound to whatever side, in this case, a right hander will fall off to the first base side, left handers falling off to the third base side. When you do that, you can't really protect yourself. And if you look at it here, when Jake delivers the ball, he falls off to the first base side. That hits him probably just above the elbow, maybe the bicep of the pitching arm. And they want to see if he's okay. And it's going to be your option, what you want to do. Well, you heard out of the corner of your ear there, it's going to be your option on what you want to do. And he'll go out. So the Sox will make another pitching change. This one forced by a line drive. Petrichka will leave. We'll tell you about the Sox new pitcher after this. Jinx me on the good read thing. <laughs> Enjoy U.S. cellular field just like a player. Play catch in the outfield, warm up of the bullpens, visit the dugouts, and much more. Join us for Family Field Day on Saturday, May 14th, and support Chicago White Sox charities. To purchase tickets, visit whitesoxcharities.org. Jake Petrichka off the field after the line drive, and he will be replaced by the right hander Daniel Webb. Looks like Jake's all right. Precautionary for the most part. And Daniel Webb, after last year, 1 0, the ERA 630, and that was largely because of the walks. When you walk 22, fan 22 in 30 innings, you're going to have some problems getting people out. He also gave up 41 hits in those 30 innings, so not the kind of year he would have liked. That was coming off a 6 and 5 year where he threw the ball pretty well, had an ERA just under 4 in 2014 for the Sox. And with Daniel, it was never a case and never has been a case of stuff. It's if he gets the ball over the plate, he's pretty successful. If he gets behind hitters, he's not. And we'll have to see if he can get it over because arm wise and ability wise, he's got everything it would take to be a valuable member of the bullpen. Control always the issue. Yeah, career a little bit less then two to one strikeout to walk in the minors 246 to 125 but translating that to the majors as Petrichka jogs off 90 strikeouts 68 walks in the majors that that next level has been the thing for Webb who will get as many pitches as he wants to warm up here with the injury to Petrichka and how about Daniel Webb being thrown into the fire his very first major league batter he faced was Derek Jeter. That didn't work out for him. Mm. His first out was not Jeter. It was <laughs> Alfonso Soriano. Well, how are you sleeping this spring? You're doing okay down I'm here? I'm doing all right, but some folks are not. Some folks are not. We hearken back to a guy who had a banner year last year. Prince Fielder hit 305 at 23 home runs. It was a 
a big bounce back year for Prince and he looked like the guy that they thought they were getting from the Tigers when they made the deal was sent Kinsler to the Tigers but Prince was sent back to Texas because of a sleep disorder and I, I don't think years ago this would have happened but now they're starting to understand exactly how damaging lack of sleep can be to a player and so they're trying to figure out through sleep studies a number of other things why Prince is having the problems he's having because if the Rangers are to do anything they have to have a very healthy and very rested Prince fielder but it's few and far between the players you ever see sent back to their home cities because of a sleep disorder but that's been the case here in Arizona and one of the things it could be and who knows they're going to do a lot of different things but we've had an unusually difficult allergy season down here because of say, the temperatures being up as high as they've been. I've experienced that too. The first game I was down here I started sneezing. I thought I was allergic to, to just you being in the area. Could very well be. You're an hour away. I the thought jury I is still a, out on that. By yeah, the way. an allergen restraining order against you. The good news about Fielder, though, I read this morning, he is back with the team. So he's good. back with the Rangers. As Webb gets ready to throw, there used to be this game show. I don't know if you ever saw this game show. It was called Cram. That was one that I missed. Okay. So what they did was they deprived people of sleep for 24 consecutive hours. Then they made them do balancing tasks while answering trivia questions, leading to much hilarity. Was that on a major network or was that on? Depends like on what you consider Horizon major. Horizon Network. <laughs> Got to pay extra for cram, huh? what it was yeah. a cram. Yeah, you should I check it out. Check into that on mm -hmm. my iPad. Once you log on to your email, why don't I you can't, send, I can't possibly send me do a that. note? Yes. First pitch, a strike throw to second is there. And Andrioli caught stealing by Avila. That's one of the things that Alex does exceptionally well, and that's catch it, call it, block it, and throw it. And this throw is right on the money. This is the only thing Andrioli has done badly today. It's been a banner day for him. He gets thrown out. Perfect throw by Avila. As they cut down Andrioli, trying to take liberties. Up the middle by Fedorovic, and he's got a single. I'd like to say hello to some of my friends looking on at Owl Ear, which is a cigar lounge. They're enjoying themselves, certainly. I don't believe they're enjoying the score as the overwhelming majority of them are Sox fans, but it's early yet, guys, so hang in there. And by the way, the Sox are three over as it stands right now. Cubs, by the by, are two and eight so far this spring. Pretty good spring. The offense has come to life. Sox come in at six, three, and one. It was an overtime loss. You get a point for that now. <laughs> On Avila, apprehending potential base stealers, 34% the last couple seasons, up from his career average. It's actually pretty good in this day and age. Used to be one of those numbers where you looked at and said, well, he's okay. Nowadays, that's actually pretty strong. Made a good block there, shifting to his right. Able to stop the baseball and make sure that Fedorovich could not wander into second base. Got a clean two into the glove. The catchers really don't try to catch these, they try to block them, but occasionally it does stick in the glove. Yesterday, by the way, was Snapchat Day in Major League Baseball, Stoney. Did you participate in Snapchat Day? I was snapping most of the day, chatting very infrequently, however. No, I, I uh, that one, that one snuck by me. Mm -hmm. Got to get a new holiday calendar. Ross to right. Third straight single for the Cubs in this inning, interrupted by the caught stealing of Andrioli.
This is a broken bat base hit. It's a fastball that Daniel got up a little higher than he would have liked. You keep that one down, usually that winds up a ground ball to second. If you keep it waist high or above, it turns into a line drive. Daniel Webb into the game with Petrichka coming out after being hit by the line drive a couple of batters ago. Fourth pitcher of the day for the Sox. Eric Johnson started the game, then Dan Jennings for an inning. Now Webb. That ball is well hit left center field. And it takes a hop. Off of the. Yeah off the ground over the fence so a ground rule double but. For a moment Negron was going to try and come home it's a ground rule double for Negron. That one lost by Liuri. Otherwise he makes this catch. The ball just keeps drifting right here he loses it. And the ball hits the warning track up and out of the ballpark so. Four straight hits. Has led to. Yet another Cub run and once again as has been their annoying propensity they have scored in every inning. So Negron with his second. RBI of the spring lost to third. Kawasaki bashes one down the line. And he's into second two run double for Munanori Kawasaki. I mean, it's two and three for Kawasaki. One of the guys trying to make this team if they go with an extra player as opposed to an eighth pitcher out of that bullpen. And he slices it just inside the line. So that's five straight hits. You said Ichiro earlier. There's that flat, compact swing from Kawasaki. Yeah. Turned it into a rocket down the line. Well, the Cubs came in hitting 203 in the spring. A quarter of their hits were home runs. They've only got one homer so far today out of 13 hits. Last year they hit well. Both for batting average and for runs scored to hit the ball out of the ballpark. This year having everybody at the start of the season pretty much healthy and they assume that Schwarber is going to be healthy. Made a throw from left field tweaked his knee. He said it's nothing serious but they're. They're going with the cautious approach as you would expect. And that one hits Fowler a slider down and in so not a particularly good start. To the outing by Daniel Webb. But I believe and everybody else seems to feel the same way that. The Cubs are going to hit. The question mark is lack of depth in the starting rotation. Will the bullpen come through? They've got some very good arms down there. And Don Cooper is going to make a trip to the mound. Well, you got Wood and you have Cahill, and you have some guys that you can expand their innings to make them into fourth, fifth type guys if you really need innings, right? Well, the flexibility of the guy who can go multiple innings out of your bullpen is something that most managers love to have. And the Cubs have three of those guys that if their starter goes out early and Joe Madden has made no secret of the fact that at the tail end of his starting rotation he doesn't mind taking pitchers out of the game a lot earlier than he would if he was talking about Arietta or Lester or Lackey. So then the bullpen and a multiple innings by your long relievers come into play. Wood was very flexible for them last year and I think Cahill's going to be that guy this year. Strike one to Jason Hayward who gets a fourth turn at bat. Again the Cubs will play later tonight at Camelback Ranch the Sox home they split with the Dodgers. 
Cubs will be at the Dodgers tonight. Sox only the one game today. Cubs have been swinging early against Daniel Webb this inning. There's looking one of the best managers around. Joe Madden. Said something pretty interesting. Said a lot of things pretty interesting, and it was nice to be able to have an extended chat with him before the game, but things are a little more casual during spring training. But he talked about the fact that you can't take anything for granted as it pertains to the knowledge of players and how to play winning baseball. On the ground at third, Frazier is there to start the double play. More on Joe Madden. Coming up in the sixth, Sox trailing the Cubs 9-1. started it's our new game that we like to call sticks and stone which is where Steve we ask you how you did against a batter that you once faced affiliated with the Sox opponent so it's your job to tell us deep in the recesses of your mind how well you did against Dave Kingman are we going to count that strikeout the 1980 all-star game because I can hardly remember the high fastball that he swung at the end of the inning so going back I assume to just the regular season I will yeah. say that Dave Kingman like so many other guys against me did very well. How 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 well is very well. Well very well would be anything over. One hundred and fifty. If he hit over one hundred fifty did very well. One eighty eight. Okay. Three two, out of nineteen. Two, two homers. Runs. Four runs batted in I only struck him out four times. Wow. Only you know, four. He was a teammate of mine. We came up together with the San Francisco Giants. He went on to have an exemplary career. Hit a lot of home runs. Apparently only two against me. But. He did what he does. He drives in runs and hits home runs. We will by the way take viewers requests for sticks and stone participants as long as nobody says Jim Rice who was 21 for 39 against me, Oof. which was somewhat embarrassing mm. yes I helped put him in the Hall of Fame Kingman what was he like we gave him the nickname moon man when he was in double A with Amarillo because at that point he had the expression on his face that I don't care what the question is. I don't know the answer. He did become a little more observant later on in his career, but he had a terrific career. Could hit the ball eight miles. Was a feared slugger in his day, and I found him to be a pretty decent fellow overall. So how do you have to pitch him? Somebody like that. 
He was a home run hitter with a classic uppercut swing. And anytime you see a guy with a lot of power and an uppercut swing, you pitch him letter high. If you do that, he doesn't give you any problems. If you get the ball down, he usually hits it a long way. Lori takes a walk. He's on for the second time in three trips to the plate today. Aaron Brooks on for his second inning in place of Jason Hamill. Through, through uh, quite well for the Cubs through four. So who's your best current comparison to somebody like Dave Kingman? Who plays like him today? You got anybody? Good question. I think Dave was surprisingly fast. He could run real well for a big man. Played a lot of different positions as well as comparison today. Let's see. Hitting home runs with an uppercut swing. Well, there is one guy who is not going to have the numbers of Dave Kingman. But has the same type of swing. That's Nick Castellanos with Detroit. Yeah, Detroit has an uppercut swing. If you get the ball down to him, he gives you some problems. If you keep the ball up, he has some problems with it. Again, he's not going to be the prolific slugger that Dave Kingman was, but just swing type, that's the kind of swing that he has. And of course, we will see a whole lot of Nick this year. Entertaining the Tigers either 18 or 19 times. The changes have begun, by the way, for the Cubs. Ryan Kalish has come into the game to play left. Andrioli moves to center. Mark Zagunas is in right field for Joe Madden. And Matt Clark has taken over first base for Anthony Rizzo. How's that marker taste, we wonder, for Joe Madden? Chewing on his Sharpie. Joe was talking about the invaluable lessons he learned as a minor league coach, a minor league manager, all the experience he had with dealing with players, which he said he made so many mistakes early that he views that as invaluable to the manager he is today and can't understand how managers start in the major leagues, which they do. It's become more and more fashionable to take a guy with no experience and make him your manager. Robin, one of those guys that was learning on the job. But Joe felt that you were, if you come up through the minor leagues and spend as much time down there as he did, then become a bench coach in the major leagues, which he was for 10 years, you run into situations that you're going to run in as a manager, and they're not going to be new to you. You're going to understand how to handle certain players. And that becomes, and guys will tell you today, that becomes the most difficult thing a manager has to do is dealing with the diverse personalities, the players of today as opposed to the players and what they were like when these guys actually started to come up. But Joe doesn't seem to have any problems with it. Two and two on Abreu. And he takes ball three. Sox with some lengthy trips to the plate with Laurie and Abreu. No, it's interesting to hear Joe Madden talk about. It. I mean, you run into different guys, certainly, but the same personality types over and over again. So you have these analogous situations and you can handle the same way. And he was very honest with us. He said, look, I, I just screwed one up recently with a player. I went in and I apologized to that player and said, look, I messed it up. And that's that's nice, honest frankness from a manager. And what he felt when he was talking to the player was that the message was delivered the way it should have been delivered but the technique of using it he was happy with the message but he would have used a different technique and the fact that he was an experienced enough manager to be able to apologize to a guy when getting across his point Abreu locks it to right Zagunas toward the line and he is there to make the play or out number one. White Sox spring training baseball is live with the MLB.com at bat app. Stay connected all spring with radio broadcasts, video highlights, stats, news, and more. Download MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball on your smartphone and tablet. It looks just like that. You just have to download it from whatever store you use for apps. 
It's got everything. Pitch types, pitch FX, all that stuff on the game day. You can't beat that. Mm. Especially if you are iPad or computer savvy. Which you certainly are. And of course, as you know, that is my middle name. It's iPad. a long, what is that? Oh, I thought you, iPad and computer savvy was your middle name. <laughs> No, eventually, and I'm hoping that when they work the bugs out of these things that I'm able to use them. Well, how long did it take you to get onto the wireless here at Sloan Park today? Roughly three hours or so? I would like to tell you because I actually haven't gotten onto it yet. You still haven't? Yeah. yeah. I'm easing my way into this. Please send all requests to Steve Stone via carrier pigeon. Care of the Chicago White Sox U.S. Cellular Field. Two strikes on Frazier, who's 0 for 2. He is scheduled to join us later on. We hope to hear from Todd from inside the dugout. It'll be good. One of the key additions to this ball club. He's coming from a very good hitters ballpark in Cincinnati to a very good hitters ballpark on the south side of Chicago. Ran into somebody yesterday who said he feels like Frazier could hit 40 considering the ballpark. He hit 35 last year, 29 the year before, slugged nearly 500 last season at 498. He was on on a path to hit well over 40 home runs, but had a very difficult second half. Two and two on Frazier. Melky in the on deck circle, hoping to get off to a better start and drive in some runs. He came on very strong the second half of the year, but like so many of the Sox hitters, just could not drive in runs the first half of the year. Broken bat grounded at third. Candelario spins it across the way and not on target. First and third for the Sox. You'd like to think that Todd would pick up a base hit. Base hit E5. That's exactly what it is. Single E5. Shatters the bat. Nice play by Candelaria. This part of it is good. This part, not so good. Way off the bag at first base. And it'll leave runners at the corners. For Melky Cabrera, who's bounced out twice to second, and the Sox will have a pinch runner over at first. It's like Matt Davidson. Pinch running. Well, Matt Davidson Sox. has been one of the real good stories of the spring because he is hitting everything in sight. Now, odds are overwhelming that he's going to be the starting third baseman in Triple A. But if he shows anything close to the potential that the Sox saw him have when they traded for him, you can never have too many power hitters in your organization. And he's getting better defensively. And at least this spring, he looks like the hitter they thought they were getting when they made the deal. To shortstop, and Davidson caught off the bat. Five and a half complete. Cubs with a big lead in Mesa.
song, at least in his career at points. Todd, is this going to be your walk-up song this year, Fly Me to the Moon? No. That's the big question. No, I got to change it. I got to change it. That chapter's over, so uh, it's going to be Frank Sinatra one way or another. I just... Uh, I still got some time to think about it. Is Chicago your kind of town? Is that what we're going to find out now? I think it might be. So uh -huh. might as well. How about that? <laughs> uh, what you got so far this spring training on the Sox? Uh, how you fitting in? What do you think of the club? Uh, everything's going well. Um, it's just good. It's a good bunch of guys. The guys come in here and work their tail off. I was telling people today, you know, you see the younger guys come in here. I can't say one thing bad about them. They come in and work their butt off. And, uh, you know, usually you got to get on. You get on a little bit, but. You know, nothing here. Everybody's trying to battle for a spot, and uh, that's what you do. You take your, take your time to do your job. Coming to a new ball club, as what looked like a routine 4-3 turns into an adventuresome 4-3. But not coming to a new ball club, is there any adjustments that you've got to make that you didn't have to make before? Um, not really. Uh, you know, I think it would be different if I came in as a young younger guy. I think... Uh, you know, you have to get acclimated a little more, but I'm, uh, you know, a little older. Um, I know a bunch of the guys already. Um, you know, we have a, we have a lot of guys that are just just starting out with the White Sox too. Uh, Rick, I think Rick Hahn did a hell of a job uh, working his butt off. Uh, you know, trying to get this team back to the championship caliber that it, that it can be and that it will be. And um, you know, I, I think he did a great job. And you see, we got guys like Brett Lowry, Alex Avila. You know, just to name two uh, two guys. And I know there's a bunch more, but. You know, we all we're on the same boat. We got to come in here and come together. And I think, uh, you know, as baseball players, it comes a little easier. It's, it's weird, but it just, it just 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 connects every time. We've we've heard about you in the clubhouse, and I I know your brother a little bit, and some folks have gotten to talk to you at Sox Fest. When did you become the type of guy that you are? That type of leader. When did that happen for you in life? I, I, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I guess my brother was, it was a senior in high school, and I was a freshman. He kind of, I kind of watched him what he did, and uh, you kind of look up to your brothers. And uh, bottom line, when he left, I came a sophomore. I kind of, you know, took over my high school team, and uh, you know, you, you either try to lead or you try to follow. And the, at the bottom line is, you come together as a team, you work your butt off. Uh, big thing with me, I bring emotion, I bring energy, enthusiasm, all that, all that kind of stuff. You know, it sounds cheesy, but you have to, you have to bring it. I think as a baseball player. You know, you're selling yourself short if you don't bring that a little energy, a little pep in your step. And, uh, you know, it could get tedious at times. But, you know, when you're out there, find a way, you know, get your mind going, get your body going. And that's what we've been doing. We do know that there's pressure on every major leaguer to perform. When you come over to a new team, do you find any added pressure? Because you've come to a team with all of a sudden some pretty high hopes as an organization. Yeah, I, I, I think um, anytime you get traded or put on a new team, uh, you, you're the guy now. Let's go. Step it up. And. You know, I've been doing that my whole life, and, um, you know, you're just at a bigger stage right now. And, uh, you know, I'm playing in Chicago. It's a bigger city. They expect a little bit more out of you, and why not? We're all baseball players here, and we should expect that out of each other every day and every uh, every year. So why not? I, I don't mind it at all if, if I'm hitting behind uh, Jose or wherever I'm hitting. Uh, you know, I'm there to help the team. So bottom line is we, we get RBIs, we win games and play the defense, and uh, we're going to have to step it up and do that. Big powers so far this spring. What uh, what's the cause? What's the reason for all these homers? Is it you? It, it's got to be, man. I, <laughs> I don't know what it is, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the pitching pretty well a couple of days ago. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. You, you, you come in every year. You, you're up. It's a nice hit. But uh, you come in every year, and you know, as from New Jersey, you don't get to hit outside. And you know, that first time you hit outside in Arizona, you wonder yourself if you still got the power, and you're trying to jack every pitch, but. You know, you just got to let it come to you. As a guy that's been playing for a long, long time now, uh, you kind of slow it down a little bit. You know, let the game, you know, come as it is. And when you need the extra work, you do it. But there's, there's no need really to, to get crazy with it and let your body just recoup. And away we go. I know you come from a baseball town. What does the game of baseball mean to, to Todd Frazier? Uh, it means everything. Uh, you know, basically growing up, like I said, with two brothers, I wanted to be what they, what they were doing. Uh, I like basketball too, but we kind of figured uh, baseball was our little stepping stone, and it, it means a lot. It's it's, it's something I tell kids, that, you know, nowadays always always have your dreams real high. Dream whatever you want to be, whatever sport you want to play, and, and that's what I want to do. I want to be a baseball player, and um, I, I tell everybody, even older people, I said, you know, when your dream comes true, um, you know, there's really nothing better than that, and uh, I'm living it right now. I can't I, can, I can't ask for anything better. Todd, thank you for the time. All right, nice talking to you guys. So it's Sinatra for sure.
Uh, yeah. Guaranteed? Most definitely. All right. Todd Frazier, new Sox third baseman, joins us from downstairs to the seventh, then maybe the boon we go. In the seventh inning, some wholesale changes to get to, including a new Cubs pitcher, Gene Machi, the former Giants World Series winner. There you look at the numbers last year at 2 0, the ERA a little bit higher than you would like, but 4 for 4 in saves, and because you can never find too many guys at the back end of your bullpen who can close down games, Cubs felt he was at least worth a look. They feel the bullpen is going to be one of the stronger assets of their team. Especially the back end of the bullpen. And if that's the case, it's certainly going to help the starting rotation. Now the Sox will get one more at bat from Avi Garcia. He'll be followed by Sanchez and Saladino. Nine one the Cubs with the lead. They scored in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth innings. One of the things that's changed is there's a new logo that the teams are wearing, which signifies that they are indeed in Arizona. And teams have it on their caps. They have it on the sleeves of their uniform. Deep to left field from Garcia. And this one is way out of here for Avi Garcia, his second homer of the spring. That's. 10 driven in by Avi as he's having just a banner spring. He got every bit of this one as this looked like a hanging slider. And that one came up there rolling and went out very quickly. They are measuring everything these days, and one of the things they measure is exit speed how quickly the ball comes off the bat. And although Avi hasn't had yet the kind of year that he would like, ball off the bat, he's among the best in baseball. And that one disappeared in a hurry. I put together some great minor league seasons with the Tigers. And, you know, we're talking about essentially a second full year in the majors. So, without making any excuses for him, it's hey I wonder if he can develop into that considering a second full year of the bats. 
that being the, the minor league numbers that he put up. Well, he's a very big man. And he's surprisingly fast for his size. He does hustle every chance he gets. Got to improve the defense. That's one of the aspects of his game that he will be looking to get a little better. But offensively, he's got just about every tool you would need to be successful. And again, Sanchez looked at a pitch that was a good four or five inches off the outside corner and gets rung up for strike three. One note, by the way, on the Sanchez strikeout. Uh, Rob Brantley's been claimed off waivers by the Mariners, so the Sox are down one catcher in camp today. They're down to 54 now in Major League camp. Rob Brantley, who put together a pretty fantastic effort as the clubhouse soccer goalkeeper earlier today in the Sox clubhouse. Things get a little dry in spring training. You have to stay loose. Yeah. And especially this time of the spring. Back to the mound, Machi handles it well. And two away. What was your favorite spring training pastime to maybe kill an hour or so? I don't think I had anything that I did consistently in the spring. Mostly I was battling to try to make this team or that. When you play with a few different clubs, you're always trying to make an impression or trying to win a spot. And so spring training then becomes a little more pressure packed for some of these guys now with long term contracts for a great deal of money. They come in pretty much knowing that they've got the spot made. So spring is a little different. They can take it easy, make sure they don't get hurt, work on aspects of their game instead of trying to excel with each and every performance. And that's a big factor. I mean, when you're working on aspects of your game and you don't really care about the result, you're liable to have a better spring than if each and every start is life and death, as with some of these young guys it has to be. Leori Garcia. To center for out number three, but Avi Garcia started the inning off with a bang. In a hurry to left, Garcia, his second homer this spring. It's nine to two. The game summary Andrioli's having the game of his spring at four for four. Dexter Fowler, two for three with a solo home run. Tyler Saladino with an RBI double. Avi Garcia with a solo home run in the seventh. And as you can see, it's all Cubs so far, having out hit our Sox 14 to 5. The Cubs have made the only two errors of the game. Honda Dream Garage Sales event now at your Honda dealer. By the way, St. John's High School in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts is going to have John Andreoli, I think, speak at graduation next year after 
this four for four game against the Sox. And well deserved with this effort today. So when you're trying to make a baseball team, it's kind of nice when you do something like that. Here's Matt Perk, the former Washington Nationals left hander. Very highly thought of coming out of college. Matt Perk has dealt with some injuries over his time in Washington. Tim Anderson checked into the game as well. He'll play shortstop and Jacob May out in center field completing the changes this half inning for the Sox. Perk a strike. And for those of you that don't know, Anderson is the number one prospect in the organization. And Tim Anderson, with a world of talent, probably needs just a few more at bats, a little more seasoning in the minor leagues, but there's not much that he can't do. And there's a look at one of the Sox hopes for the future. The guy who was signed. Drafted, developed through the Sox system, and now is trying to show what he can do before he goes back down and getting the at bats he does truly need in the minor leagues. He is a new father as well. His daughter, Eaton, born the other day, as Perk gets a strikeout to lead off the seventh. Congratulations to Tim and his wife Bria, uh, daughter Peyton. And his numbers, Tim Anderson, in Juco in 2013, he led the nation with a 495 batting average. I mean, eye popping numbers, certainly. It's not the majors. He's not going to hit 500 in Major League Baseball, but those numbers essentially came out of nowhere and were some of the best in the country. That's what gets you the designation as a number one draft choice. And then after that, you've got to perform. You can't just piggyback off those numbers. You can try to use it as a springboard, but somewhere along the line, you're going to have to show that you can hit major league pitching. At Canapolis in his first year in 13, he hit 277. Then split some time mostly playing at Winston Salem in 2014, hitting 297. Outside corner, strike three, and Matt Burke has a couple of punch outs here in the seventh. And Rob Drake using that generous outside corner as you would expect. That was pretty good pitch. Probably just off the corner, but close enough to be called. Would you say the strike zone is more expansive in spring training? I would say it should be, especially in a game that's nine to two. You would always say it should be. You're yeah. a pitcher. Well, I would say that it's not quite expansive enough. Yeah. Up the middle. And a base hit for Munenori Kawasaki, who's two for four in the game. That's a 15th base hit for the Cubs. Jacob May, who is newly in the ball game, is in the top ten as far as prospects are concerned. A whole lot of speed. Family. Yeah. Good baseball lineage and Twice he sold 37 bases, so that gives him a chance, certainly. Mr. May out in center field, enjoying the high sky. They rated him coming in the seventh best prospect in the organization, they being Baseball America. Ryan Kalish takes ball number one in that one spot previously occupied by Dexter Fowler, who singled, scored twice, and homered today. A lot of people figure that the Cubs are the best team in the Central. They're going to have. An argument there with both Pittsburgh and St. Louis, but St. Louis 
Got a pretty bad break in Johnny Peralta who tore a thumb ligament had surgery. They say out for sure for a month. Obviously it's going to be longer than that. Peralta pretty good player. Certainly since putting on that Cardinal uniform he's shown that. He can play a little bit better defensively because of the positioning. Good news for the Cardinals is they do at least have Jed Jerko and a couple others who might be able to play shortstop at the injury. After seven, Cubs in the lead, 9 2. Fans intermingling as one. Isn't it beautiful, Stoney? What's beautiful is the fact that this ballpark, which was packed today, allows people to get a running start at going to Portillo's, which is in the yeah. shadow of the park. I, uh, I've been known to crush a chocolate cake shake every once in a while. Chicago favorite, certainly. There's two locations here for your dining pleasure. And there it is. So this uh, this being the anniversary of FDR's first fireside chat I want to ask you something about the state of the game of baseball. Is it a tired game like Bryce Harper says it is. It was kind of unusual to read that yeah, and it's strange. Yeah, certainly Goose Gossage had some kind words for that particular explanation of the game as Goose. Being a former roommate of mine. Has come out of his shell which is kind of nice. Finally, yes. After all these years, I do remember when Goose was with San Diego and they released him. He accused Ray Kroc of trying to poison the country, which I thought was a bit much. But Goose always wanted to speak his mind. And as far as Bryce Harper is concerned, everybody is entitled to his own opinion. As far as the game being tired, I think Bryce said that because he said, "Well." They don't like to see fist pumping and bat flips. I'm not sure that the indictment on the game as being tired would depend on flipping the bat or pumping your fist. Mike Olt to third. That is a fair ball, and he is out by a step on the throw by Daniel Lockhart. Hey, Bryce Harper. Getting to know him a little bit in the minors, he does respect the game of baseball. He plays it hard for the right reasons. So that was an interesting word to choose. I was kind of surprised only because, along with Mike Trout, Bryce Harper is 
one of the new faces of the game and a, a very talented guy just winning the MVP. And Through the again, left side for Lombard Dozy, a base hit. Not much that, that Harper can't do. I, I think that. Let's say it was an unfortunate description of what I think is an infinitely fascinating game. Yeah. I think the game. When you boil it down and you peel away the layers of the game is very complex. It can be very exciting depending on how good your team is at any given time. Harper plays it at a very high level. And again, he certainly is entitled to that opinion, one that I don't share. But one that he came out and felt that maybe the game needs more colorful characters in his opinion. But it, but in there a history in the game of Every generation's colorful characters. Somebody's challenging the boundaries at all times. Always. I mean, that's always been the case. And again, in order for you to be considered colorful, as opposed to boring or dull, it depends on your performance. When you're doing great, as Harper is, and you have the talent that Harper has, he will be considered colorful. Travis Ishikawa gets hit by that pitch. The two on for the Sox here in the eighth. So my takeaway is the moral of the story for you is you don't have to impugn the game while still asking for more color from the game. No, I think I think the game will always have its characters and are they quite as colorful as they were many years ago? I think in certain respects they are. There are certain guys who give you great quotes. They give you certainly interesting anecdotes if you spend the time to get to know them. I don't believe that you can say that the game is less colorful because a lot of guys don't flip their bats. As far as fist pumping is concerned, I don't see any legislation against fist pumping anywhere. Got caught up in the house. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as as flipping your bat, I think as long as you don't show up the opposition, I think that was the major factor that Goose was trying to make when he made his comments. So essentially, are they arguing over nothing there? I mean, do they agree more than it seems? I'm not sure there was an argument. I think Goose has his opinion, and the opinion is that in. Goose's situation the game is not played today like it was before and he's right about that the game isn't played today like it was years ago but it doesn't make it better or worse than one another Davidson went after a bad one a rare sight this spring and he is down that's only his second strikeout in 18 at bats this spring and that number is down I know it's a small sample size but he's made significantly more contact this spring well, he's also lowered his hand, and that's been a big factor because the swing has gotten better. He feels a lot more comfortable, and if that's the case, he's not going to swing near as much as he did before because when when guys with long swings swing at just about everything and don't wake back enough, you wind up expanding the zone and have no chance whatsoever because the better pitchers are not going to give you early in the count pitches to hit. So now Jerry Sands who was one of those guys that was a possibility for the final roster spot Then Austin Jackson got added and you wonder where Jerry Sands maybe fits in if he's going to Charlotte or, or what at one point Sands was a highly thought of prospect with the Los Angeles Dodgers and he always had a whole lot of power but although nothing has been decided so far there is some competition for the one lone outfield spot and Jerry Sands is going to be given, as they say, every opportunity to try to secure that spot. A little bit low on Sands. Again, Austin Jackson likely to take part in the game in the next couple of days, from what we're hearing. He's in camp. He's been in camp, and, and the Sox have gotten a look at him. But he's yet to play in a game so far. I think that's a huge addition to the team because of the flexibility he gives and also the fact is he can really play defense. And when you put him in a ball game or start him in center field, you're pretty well assured that you're going to have a guy that can go get him alley to alley. And with 
the problems on the corners last year as far as Melky slowing down somewhat and Abby having some problems at times. If you can slide Adam Eaton over to one of those positions and put Jackson in center field you've got yourself a better defensive outfield. That was one of the problems last year the defense wasn't quite as good so with the improved inner defense and the defense is going to be improved in the infield. And you can improve at times depending on who you play the defense in the outfield. That can help but benefit a pitching staff and take the pressure off the offense. You're not going to have to score near as many runs if you can catch the ball. Don't give anybody that fourth out. Turn the double play when it has to be turned. And the addition of Fraser at third base is just huge because of his defensive prowess. First game of spring training. The Sox are playing the Dodgers at home. Home for both of them. Frazier in the same inning had to charge a ball to third, made that play coming in, backed up on one at third as well, like the drills that they do sometimes to come in and then go back out. And he did them both seamlessly in our very first look at him this spring in Arizona. I think Robin, who made himself into a very good third baseman, probably appreciates what Frazier has done defensively because. The last few years we've had all kinds of problems trying to fill that void down there. Now you've got a guy who. Is going to make every play. Some of the spectacular variety but certainly he's not going to miss much. Upstairs and that is. Ball four to Sands. A lot of people don't realize when you've got a third baseman that has very good mobility. To especially his left. You take a lot of pressure off the shortstop and the positioning of that shortstop. He doesn't have to worry about the hole near as much. He can then take away a lot of base hits up the middle that he wouldn't have gotten to if he was protecting against the hole. We're talking about pre play positioning or in play movement there. Both. Fly ball right hand side, and that will do it. For the Sox during the eighth inning, nearly lucrative inning, they strand them loaded. Beautiful day in Mesa. Miller Lite, the original light beer. It's Miller time. Honda, get amazing deals at the Honda Dream Garage sales event. Now at your Honda dealer. Xfinity, your home for the most live sports. And by your Chicago and Northwest Indiana Hyundai dealers. Stop by a local Hyundai dealer today to test drive their all-star lineup of cars and SUVs. Visit buyhyundai.com. Back to Mesa. Stoney, you like the new old logo there? I like that logo. I think that on the caps, in spring training at least, it makes for a very tall brim. Looks like you have a fairly substantial front of your head. But outside of that, it's good looking. Are you self conscious about your coconut? Oh, no. I don't wear those hats. In fact, 
yet, at least. That was just a plea to get you one up here to the booth, wasn't it? I actually, I actually have secured one. I'm going to give it to that little person. You are. That's so kind of you. Philippe Amat coming in the game. That's what we call a segue in the business. Last year, one and six with an ERA of 680. Big guy, former a, Philadelphia Philly farmhand. He's a tall fellow. Hmm. Dropped down a little bit there, 2 and 0 oh from Almont. Mark Zagunas took over in right field a couple of innings ago, and he leads off for the Cubs here in the eighth. talk this being our first game very much about the Sox bullpen and we haven't seen many of the principals in that bullpen who are likely to break camp with the team so far but you had Nate Jones back to that picture finally back and healthy or at least it seems that's an addition that certainly will help and I talked with David Robertson having the one year here already coming over from the Yankees and I don't think it's easy that first free agent year. He got off to a pretty good start, and then things didn't work quite as well as he would like. But it's a pretty good guy to have at the tail end. A guy that, because of his time with the Yankees, has got to be impervious to pressure, or you can't pitch in New York. So that part of it is good. The Sox bullpen has never hurt for quality arms. Check swing and Zagunas held up. So ball four and a leadoff walk here in the eighth for the Cubs. Zach Duke last year had a pretty good year along with Jennings, the two left handers out there. They did a pretty decent job. Ahmad had four different shots at Trying to stay up with Philadelphia. He originally was a first round draft pick of Seattle. The 11th pick overall. Taylor Davis who's got the. Goose Gossage look going on. Former Moorhead State University player in the Ohio Valley Conference, Taylor Davis, has yet to make his major league debut. Yeah. On the ground at third, nice backhand stab by Davidson for the first out in the home eight. So good as to second. That was a terrific play down the line, and Matt was able to stop Plant, get enough on the throw to cut Davis down to first base. This is a big effort. That's one of the aspects of his game that has slowly improved the defense at third base. Well, there's a goodness at second and one away. Here in the eighth for the Cubs, who scored in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth innings, including three in the first. The first five reached in the game against Sox starter Eric Johnson. Almont pitched for Team Canada back in 2009 in the World Baseball Classic. He is a large fella, 6'7. They list him at 240 pounds. You know, it's tough to think about. He was a center fielder when he started. He became a pitcher at age 14. Originally, was a center fielder. Pretty 
big dude out there in center if he was that big when he was younger. Well, being a number one draft choice, he obviously chose the right position. He has yet to be able to put it all together in the major leagues, but getting an opportunity to go to a new organization, sometimes it pays dividends, especially when you have a pitching coach like Don Cooper. He was signed as a free agent this past offseason. It's a swing and a miss there for strike three. Down goes Matt Clark and two away. Yes, Matt Clark over there. How do you teach a youngster about spring training games? Well, you see, everybody starts for the first four innings and everybody comes out. What the youngster is profoundly interested in is the concession stand. <laughs> Whether it's spring training or regular season, he just wants to know what there is to eat. When he finds that out, then he falls in love with the game, and that's what I love to see as the youngsters coming to ball games early. That's how you make new baseball fans. And that young man eventually will learn in which direction the field resides. Baby steps, all right? Although sometimes it is better to look in the direction he's looking in, depending on the game, as you would understand when you look at 9 to 2 today. Well, he's wearing Cubs gear, though, so. Yes. The other option is just play with the grass. Come the eighth inning. As you look at a spring training roster, though, with guys that, you know, you don't have your name on the back of your jersey, you have those big numbers. As you said earlier about somebody like a Matt Davidson, you're playing for something. You're playing for attention, really, right? Well, Matt Davidson is well known by. Well, the, sure. The, the he was the example we yeah. talked about playing for oh, something. I mean, when you get an opportunity in spring training to get into a major league game and you're not playing in the B game on one of the backfields. You're going to try to make an impression and the one thing that people don't understand is if you're blocked at your position and there's no doubt that Matt Davidson having Fraser here or if you shift to the other side having a gray you here for a great amount of time every time you go out there you are auditioning for 29 other teams besides your own and so you're trying to do the best you can because you know there's scouts looking at everything you're doing they're looking at can you hustle? Will you hustle? How are you going to play in a 9 to 2 game? What does your stroke look like? How are you defensively? That play he just made, believe me, in just about every scout's book, that's going to go down. And they're going to put in, you know, pretty good. Good mobility to his right, strong enough arm to get it across. And that's what happens. You've got to realize if you can't make it with your organization, maybe you'll make it with another one. Base hits a left, cuts out first and third, and that, that goes for some high percentage of players in spring training. I mean, we're talking about one specific instance with Matt Davidson, but that's a lot of guys across both the cactus and grapefruit leagues. Especially when you look at ways you get to other organizations. The Rule 5 draft, if you're left unprotected at a certain level, you can be drafted at a higher level by a team. It's called the Rule 5 draft. A waiver claim. If a team is going to send you down, if you don't have any options left. While we're at it, while we're at it, on yes. options, for those that are uninitiated, take everybody through what, what an option is and, and how an option year works. Being mindful of the fact that we have two outs. <laughs> well, if let's put it this way. If you don't have any options left, meaning if they send you down to the minor leagues, you can be lost to another team because you don't have options left. That's kind of an enviable position to be in because the team 
that is sending you down realizes they risk losing you. If you have options left, that means that they can send you down and you're protected. Nobody else can claim you, so you're going to stay with that organization. And when you become a member of the 40-man roster, to be sent to the minor leagues, you have to use an option. The players who are not on the 40-man roster, well, it doesn't really matter to them. And to clarify, option makes it sound like it's one choice each time you do it. That's an option. You have option years. Yeah, it is, is, it is a year. You can be sent down as many times as possible in the course of a season. You only use one option. And I believe once you get to the third, you have no more left. No and, and a lot of times that comes into play when teams make their decision on who they're going to keep. If a player has options and the other guy doesn't and they're pretty close to one another, you will keep the guy with no options left if you don't want to use it. Lose him. Shortstop Anderson blocks it off and the Cubs are done. Here are the eight. top nine. We swing away as long as we keep our bat night two. Play of the game, and Bobby Garcia got a hold of a slider and took it way back. That narrowed the gap at the time to a seven run Cub lead. One of the few exciting moments of the day for the Sox in this nine to two game. Our Miller Light play of the game. Nine two, the Cubs with the lead, and Brandon Gomes is the new pitcher. For the Cubs. Base Hector Sanchez. Who's in his second at bat. Replacing Alex Avila. And ball one. To Sanchez. Well you and I will be back with the folks on the 18th in six days. And we will be entertaining. The Cubs at again. our ballpark. Mm -hmm. The Cubs. Center field and one away. I am auditioning, by the way, just so you know, in case you were wondering, a brand new briefcase. Really? Yes. How about that? I have yet to commit. Seeing as it appears to have a little less room than my longtime number one briefcase. You rate your briefcases? What's a briefcase is UZR. How does it feel <laughs> that's position? <laughs> well, you get very comfortable with all the positioning and all of that. These pictures are weird. 0 and 1 on Anderson. A 
the ball outside one and one. You think it's easy to stand 60 feet six inches away from a guy with a huge bat who wants to hit line drives off your bicep like they did to Jake Patrichka today who by the way was escorted from the game just for precautionary reason he appears to be okay but so Jake only faced one guy only to see a line drive come rocketing back to him appears to be just fine which is good news because he's probably going to be a big part of that bullpen. Tim Anderson, the guy he replaced, Tyler Saladino. We saw the Garcia home run. Saladino has the other RBI today, an RBI double in the fifth, scoring Avi Garcia. Anderson whips this one to right field. So how have you enjoyed overall your First experience doing White Sox baseball on a beautiful day in Mesa, Arizona. Well, that I've enjoyed myself thoroughly, but really what matters is whether or not the fans have enjoyed it thoroughly. Hopefully they are still around. I'm sure they are. The spring training occasionally when the game gets out of hand, folks have a tendency to go to dinner. Well, this is the fun part of baseball, right? Well, it's the last game that we are going to televise. Which We're done? Will be, no, which will be a non daylight savings time game. Good point. Because if those of you who are not in Arizona remember, you spring ahead and you fall back. And that is this evening. So I don't have to do anything to my clock here. Zero. Don't even touch your clock. If you touch your clock, you will not be allowed to broadcast or you'll be late to the game in six days. So it's Arizona and Hawaii that don't participate. Is that right? In daylight saving time? It used to be a shred of land in Indiana, but I think they've done away with that. So unless you're planning to travel to Hawaii, don't worry about it. It's a long trip just for a day. And just so you don't have to touch your clock. It is very difficult to miss the timing on these things now because the, the phone just does it for you. You don't have to change the microwave and change the oven like you used to necessarily. That's assuming that you are cooking in your residence. Which well, I'm just, not sure you that don't you do are. that? No, oh, that I am. Yeah. Oh, and it's difficult to get that done. <laughs> I don't have any pots and pans. Here with me. There's a pretty happy fan who yeah. goes up over the top to get a souvenir, almost forgetting his phone in the process. Could you imagine the story there? Go to the electronics store. What happened, sir? What happened to your phone? Oh. Dropped it behind a tarp. All right. Here's one more look at the phone. His his buddy does grab him making sure he doesn't tumble onto the field and get escorted from the game leaving his phone on the tarp. Before finally realizing that. If you're going to make a call you best have one of these Looks like a Notre Dame fan with the hat there. If anybody knows that man please text him and tell him to be a little bit more careful with his phone. Strike three two down here in the ninth. For Mike Holt. Our thanks too to Robin Ventura and Todd Frazier for joining us from downstairs. Great to chat with the guys from inside the dugout. Robin had some very interesting things to say. We talked with him in the third inning, and he seems to be getting a whole lot more comfortable. I think he really relishes the fact that he has as much flexibility as he has with this roster. And with that, and with the additions that Rick Hahn made in the wintertime comes expectations. I don't know if there's any other team in baseball that has been picked in as many different spots as the White Sox. We've heard they're going to win 79 games. We've heard they're going to win 90 games. We've heard they're going to finish last. We've heard they're going to finish first. It seems like 
more than any other team, there's a lot of confusion as to just exactly where the White Sox will wind up at the end of this year. And it could very well be because they got off to the slow start last year. A lot of people also realize that the division really didn't help themselves very much. Two strikes on Olt. He's on the modern. Had a huge win yesterday, a UConn guy. The Huskies in four overtimes over Cincinnati. Two and two. Breaking ball for strike three. And the Sox fall to the Cubs today, nine to two. Well, it's one of the books. Congratulations. It was a pleasure. Stoney? Indeed it was. Why don't we do it again, shall we? Do it in a week. 9-2, final score. Cubs over the Sox here in Mesa.